kind of log this up on that boat. Yeah, see what you like. Right here. There you are, you little blinder. <laughs> Hold on a moment. What is going on here? Much obliged, Pastor Newton. And if you just hold him, I'll give him the cane and he deserves. As a point of personal privilege, sir, no one shall be whipped in my presence. Then you deal with him. What has he done wrong? Sir, fighting with the other boys, disobedience, swearing. They tipped over me stall. Oh, sir, he's a bad seed. These are serious charges. I'm serious, sir. Please, stand back and let me give him the cane and he deserves. Not in my presence, Mr. Chapman. Fine. He's your problem. You deal with him. A wash man to the little cad. Huh. Thank you, sir. Fighting, eh? Swearing? These are serious charges. You're Mrs. Watson's oldest, aren't you? Aye, she's me stepmom. Hmm. Well, I was about to go inside for a spot of tea. Would you like to join me? Might there be any biscuits? Well, there might be. Let's go see. So, fighting and swearing. You wouldn't understand. No? How could you? you you're the poor and in all. <laughs> I think I might understand much better than you think. I was once a little boy myself, and I think uh, by the time I was your age, I'd been expelled from two different schools for fighting and swearing. You? Never. Mm. Yes, I wasn't always a church parson, you know. In fact, I've been a great many different things in life, and I've probably done things far worse than fighting and swearing. Like what? Well, I was a cabin boy on a ship. I was a ship's captain later on. I was even a slave for a while. Nah, sir. You're letting me on. No, I'm not. Would you like to hear a little of my story? Well... Are there more biscuits? <laughs> there might be, yes, and more tea as well. Of course, it was all a very long time ago, you understand, but I don't think that little boys have really changed that much, do you? I remember my dear mother as if it were only a few weeks ago. She taught me to pray. She taught me to read by reading me the scriptures. She died when I was only six. My father was a merchant seaman, a captain. While I'm sure that he loved me in his own way, I don't recall ever feeling loved by him. He soon remarried a beautiful young woman who bore him other children. She wasn't terribly interested in me, and so he was away at sea, and I ended up in boarding school. It wasn't long before I was expelled from that school for the same sort of trouble you've been in. You mean fighting? I and general disobedience. When I was young, I had this hot core of anger inside of me that burned all the time, and it was out of control. I couldn't control my actions always. I... You do understand, don't you? It wasn't long before I was expelled from the next school for the same thing, and my father decided that the only thing to be done was to take me to sea, and so I went on a ship with him when I was 11. We served as cabin boys, carrying and cleaning and doing whatever any grown-up sailor wanted done. But that burning core of anger was still inside me, and when it would burn, I would always end up in trouble. Daughter, suck on that, young Master Newton. Maybe you'll think twice about flinging blasphemies around in me galley. 
I took my anger out on the other boys, the ones who were smaller than I, and ended up in trouble again. But in spite of the trouble I got into, I grew into a man aboard merchant ships, and I became an able-bodied seaman. Ship leaves next Wednesday for Jamaica. We can use you if you'll sign on. Aye, sir, I will. I'll be visiting in Kent for a few days, but I can be back for Wednesday. Little did I know how those few days in Kent would affect the rest of my life, for it was there, staying with friends of my mother, that I met the love of my life, my Polly. Her name was Mary, Mary Catlett, and almost from the first time I saw her, my heart was a captive. My secret nickname for her was Polly, my dear Polly, my beloved. She was a little younger than I, and her beautiful smile melted my heart and made a permanent mark upon my soul. Mr. Newton, I shall speak plainly. We loved your dear mother and held in the highest regard. Mary is too young yet for any decision. But her father and I do not object to an understanding, provided, yes. provided that when you return from your voyages, we will see some signs of stability and of prospect. Prospect? Prospect for living, Mr. Newton, is of great importance. Yes. I shall keep that in mind, Mrs. Catlett, and I shall return. Now I went back to sea with a goal in mind, to make my way, to find advancement, to make my fortune, so that I could return and marry my dear Polly. The beautiful memory of her smile, of her sweet face, got me through many long watches and lonely nights at sea. But even the memory of her smile could not keep me from trouble. That hot anger burned inside me still and would boil over at times. No! Send him to the surgeon! And you, Newton? You're on report. Reduce rations for a week. And of course, I was a seaman at sea, no different from any other. When at port, I joined heartily in the sins that waited any sailor. <laughs> but not all temptations were in port. Ah, you're a fool if you believe all that blather. All this can be explained by reason and science. Ah, uh, there's no God up there. The rationalists have it, right? Is that what you do when you're off duty? Read philosophers? Aye. There's lots of hours at sea, John. Lots of time to think. Hobbes, Voltaire. They make more sense than a pack of priests mumbling Latin. Ah, uh, nothing but superstition to control the rest of us. You should read Hobbes. I'll loan you his book, Leviathan. And so I, too, became a sailor philosopher of sorts. Spinoza and Hobbes often made quite a deal of sense, and just as often made me doubt the simple faith of my childhood. One night at sea, I fell asleep over a book, and I had the strangest dream, one that would come back to me again and again throughout my life. As long as you preserve this ring, you will be successful and happy. But should you lose it or part with it, you must only expect sorrow and distress.
You believe that ring is magic? As long as I preserve and keep it, I should be happy and successful. Ha <laughs> ha, are you naughty boy? What a simpleton. You believe anything you're told, don't you? It seemed right. What's right about it? Some stranger hands you a ring, tells you it's magic, it's a talisman, and you believe him? What a poltroon! Seriously, John, how can you buy such claptrap? To ascribe magical powers to a wee piece of metal shaped in a circle? Why, I'd be ashamed to admit such superstitions to another man. Don't you understand? That by subscribing to such superstitions, it saps your own human powers of reason. Throw it away. Go on. Throw it away. Create your own fate. Take control of your own destiny. Go on. Throw it away. Go on. Go on. Show you're a man. do with it. I threw it away. I threw it away. Where did you throw it? brought it back for you. <gasps> no. If you were to be entrusted with this ring again, you would soon bring yourself to the same distress. You are not able to keep it. But I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. It wasn't long before that voyage was nearing its end and I would be able to return to Kent to visit my Polly. As the ship turned home, all my thoughts had turned to her in the prospect of again seeing her sweet face. But it was not to be. Less than five miles from her house, I encountered a press gang. These were the days of an impending war with France, and the Navy needed fresh men all the time. Press gangs roamed the country, authorized to virtually kidnap a lightly young lad and press him into the service of His Majesty's Navy. Run! It's a press gang! Oh, 
He's awake. Welcome to His Majesty's Navy. What's your name, son? <clears throat> John the Newton. Let's see. All right. A day out of Liverpool. You was the last conscript brought on board. Here, drink something. It'll help you feel better. HMS Orange, newly commissioned man of war, under the command of Captain Carteret. We're on our way to France to defend king and country. We're always fighting with France or Spain, ever since Eve bit that apple. I was on my way to propose to my beloved. Oh, it's a shame. Four years will be out, I expect. Four years? Aye. <sighs> Captured, carried away from my love against my will, imprisoned at sea. Each day on the ocean took me further from Polly and increased my resentment. the other sailors. We've all got our crosses to bear. Leave me alone. <sighs> the smoldering anger that had always burned in me was now a fire of resentment. I obeyed orders. I did my job, but I did so with a sullen attitude. In my mind, God himself had cheated me. Why did you do this to me? Am I such a sinner that you had to single me out for special punishment? I have nothing to do with you. But I was no fool. I soon perceived that I had a greater chance of liberty if I was promoted. And so I began to focus all my rage into hard work and efforts to please the officers. Not because I had any true respect for them, but because I saw it as my opportunity for a change. So I started to work hard. Aye, sir. And I showed officers great respect. Newton. Sir. Good job, Seaman. Thank you, sir. At least to their faces. You wish to see me, sir? Aye, Mr. Newton. Your father is a merchant captain. Aye, sir. I've heard good things of him. He's written me asking that I consider you for advancement. I've spoken to the mate, and he says that you have been an exemplary seaman. I try my best, sir. That's the attitude. What would you say to being promoted to midshipman? Aye, sir. I would like that very much. Didn't think you'd refuse. So be it. You are promoted to midshipman. Being a midshipman meant that I was a sort of apprentice officer, and I was set over my former mates. Come on, you sluggards, get to work! 
pull that mopping. I want that clean up you can eat off of. Aye, sir. Set the topsail. Lay the shrouds. Sails mended, seaman. While I behaved with perfect form to my superiors, the rage inside me often was taken out on the sailors who were now under me, much as I had once bullied smaller children. You call that a knot, seaman? Aye, sir, figure of eight. It's a floppy mess. Take it apart and start again. Aye, sir. Talk back and there'll be no rations for you tonight. Aye, sir. After some months at sea patrolling the channel and even fighting skirmishes with French ships, we had to put back into Plymouth for repairs. And then it was that I had my chance. Mr. Newton, while we have repairs, I'm going to permit a rotation of shore leave for the seamen. I'm assigning you to go ashore with them and supervise to make sure none of them desert. Aye, sir. It was as if the master had left the cat to guard the cream. I'll be back at sunset. Anyone not here and ready to return to the ship should be counted as deserting and shall feel the lash. Aye, Aye sir. sir. All right, off with you. Here at last was my chance to go see my Polly. I wasn't much on thinking things through in those days, and it didn't really occur to me that desertion would catch up with me. Desertion from His Majesty's Navy. Mr. John Newton, charged with desertion from His Majesty's Royal Navy. A charge punishable by death when found guilty by court martial, or lesser punishment by a ship's captain as defined by Article 16 of the Articles of War. Captain, what shall be the punishment? He shall be demoted from his present position and stripped of all rank. He shall be tied to the main mast and administered 12 lashes with the cap. Let each of you witness what happened to those who desert His Majesty's service. No one shall speak a word to Mr. Newton for seven days. No one shall show him favor. No one shall share any ration with him other than the bread and water assigned by the galley master. Are these instructions clear? Aye, Aye sir. sir. You got your own now, don't you, Mr. High and Mighty? Nothing more than what you deserve. Enjoy your meal, sir.
it sealing up. You can sleep in a hammock from now on. We'll have you up swabbing the deck in no time. Mr. Jensen? Pass the word to Mr. Jensen. Mr. Smythe? Pass the word to Mr. Smythe. Mr. Newton. But Captain, sir. I said Mr. Newton, sir. Pass the word to Mr. Newton. The captain had conscripted two gunners from a passing ship. Maritime law required that he replace them with able-bodied seamen so that the civilian ship would not be short-handed. This gave Captain Carteret the perfect opportunity to get rid of some troublemakers. Able-bodied seamen, my ass. Two of you were scurvy and one barely recovered from the scourge. Well, I can tell you, you'll feel the cat again, you disobey on this ship. Aye, Aye sir. sir. This is a slave ship. We'll be 18 months on the Triangle. Serve well, and you'll be rewarded. Serve poorly, and you'll be punished. Understood? Aye, Aye sir. sir. Dismissed. I came to like many of the sailors on the Levant. The old rage still burned inside me. But now it was directed all at the captain. That's a sloppy bit of work there, Mr. Newton. That's the way you worked on the orange. No wonder you were flogged. Aye, listen up, mates. We've come up with a little song about old Mr. Phelps up here. Did you ever see the likes since you've been to sea? Let the good ship rock. A panty-legged captain with a bent back knee, wobbling down the dock. Wobbling down the dock. Let the good ship roll and rock. Better call a cobbler to cobble up the wobbler. We'll anchor at the Banan Islands in Sierra Leone tomorrow. I'll need a crew of three to row me in to meet with the trader. Harkness, Smythe and, and Newton. The following day, we'll sail to Cockerell Bay where we'll load the cargo. I like that. A man could think about staying here, he could. You like what you see, then? Do I? I'll bet you on trader there lives like a king. What's not to like? What do you think, Newton? Ah, uh, you both are daft. It might be nice for a while. I want to get back to England. I want to see my Polly. Smythe, Harkness, make ready the boat. Newton, you stay here with me. Mr. Campbell, this is Mr. Newton, the young man I was telling you about. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. <laughs> you won't be so pleased once you understand the deal. I've traded you, Mr. Newton. You're to stay here as a servant. How do you like them apples, Mr. Funny Man? So you've met a lash. You'll meet again soon enough if you don't serve well. 
They're my property now, Newton. And there's no way off this island without me knowledge or me permission. So don't you go be getting any bright ideas. You have to be a servant for me, wife. Serve her well. Do as you're told. And your life will be much easier. But you buck against, and you'll find out just how hard a life can be. You guard, take him to P.I. She's always wanted to have a white man as a slave. Now she's got one. He is not much to look at, is he? Give him a mat and chain him behind the house. First, we must break him. My defiance, my sins, had all caught up with me. I was a slave. They gave me only a little to eat for days. Just enough to drink to keep me alive. Take the chains off today. You are P.I. slave. Do you understand? You must do exactly as she bids. If you try to run away, we will hurt you and chain you. If you disobey, you will be whipped. If you try to run away twice, we will kill you slowly in a way that will make you wish for death to come. Do you understand? Yes. Now go and serve your mistress. No ah, my little white man. Oh, you must be so terribly hungry. How could you have treated my little white man so badly? Here, let me give you some food. You would like something to eat, wouldn't you? I'm sure you would. I'm sure you are starving. The food will taste so good. <laughs> She worked me like a mule. She seemed to take particular delight in watching me suffer, often making me do chores that were simply pointless. Ah, very good. Now that you have placed the logs here, put them back and place them exactly where you found them. <laughs> Coconut milk. Go bring me some.
No punch. No punch. New time. Where is my coconut? You are useless, even as a slave. For a long time, I felt nothing but hunger and despair. I could never forget that I was the lowest form of life on the island. Even the native slaves had thatched huts to live in, while I had to sleep on the ground under the stars. On the other hand, Campbell and P.I. lived in a great brick house at the center of the island. I was seldom allowed in the big house, and then only to do menial labor. But as long as I obeyed P.I.'s abusive commands, they fed me a little, and I regained some strength in mind as well as body. One night I lay looking at the expanse of the heavens. I began to try and see how many constellations I could identify, how many stars I could name. This became a nightly game that became a private area of freedom for me. And I began to dream again of my dear Polly, my beautiful Polly. I wonder if I will ever see her again. Then one night, it seemed to me that a group of stars formed a circle, a ring, a constellation I had never seen before and never since. It may have been my eyes playing a trick, or perhaps a planet had wandered into an unusual position visible from this latitude. But that night, I could indeed see a ring, a ring like the one in my dream. You are not able to keep it. But... I will preserve it for you, and whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. During the days when P.I. was in a mood, I would work very hard. But then there would be hours of boredom when there was nothing to do. One day, I found a small lime tree growing near the village that seemed much like me, beaten and starving, despairing of life. I adopted that little tree as my own and began to take care of it, to water and to fertilize it. I found other seedlings and planted them in what became my own little garden. One day, Campbell had me move heavy crates into the big house. I was alone for a few moments, and there I came upon a dusty old geometry book. I took it and hid it under my mat. I began in my spare time to work geometry problems, scratching diagrams in the sand. Using the sun and the shadow of my little lime tree, I calculated the latitude and longitude of the islands we were on, which were commonly called the Banana Islands. Just like the stars, like the little lime tree, it gave me something to focus on, a space that was mine and mine alone. There was little I could do with the knowledge, but the exercise did much to keep my mind occupied and sharp. One day, when I was tending to my little garden and passing the time with equations written in the sand, Mr. Campbell and P.I. walked down the path and caught sight of what I was doing. Newton, what are you doing, man? Are you growing your own limes? <laughs> I was terrified that P.I., as cruel as she was, would make me destroy my little place of sanity. <laughs> well, who knows? 
maybe one day before those trees are full grown, you can sail back to England and you can be the captain of your own boat. Then you can come back here and enjoy the fruits of your labors. <laughs> then again, perhaps you will become the king of Poland. <laughs> <laughs> What is this? Do you understand the mathematics? Yes, sir. Uh, I taught myself. Oh. It might not be a complete waste after all. Here are a set of equations. I'd like for you to solve them. What is it? A test? Aye, if you will. I want to see just how good you are with these mathematics. Sit down, sit down. I'm in need of a clerk to manage my factory at Kittim. There are not very many people in Sierra Leone who understand numbers. Factory? Aye. It's my slave trading post. It's where the Bombo bring in slaves from the interior and make them ready for transport to the West Indies. My brother runs the factory, but he's in need of someone who can keep the accounts. You will go there. You will serve him now. The guard will take you. At Kittum, my life changed dramatically. I had new, clean clothes to wear. Angus Campbell treated me well, almost as an equal. Bombo treated me with respect, inviting me to their feasts. I thought of Polly often, but before long I had given up any hope of ever returning to England. My circumstance had changed from one of daily despair to one of comfort. I had all I needed, food, shelter, clothing, respect, and even women. Thoughts of England faded, and my life in Kittim began to envelop every part of my being. The other settlers even had an expression for it. They called it going native. saying? It means freedom. Then came the day 
when my entire world would suddenly change again, as if a lightning bolt had struck. Mr. Newton, I'm not here to see you. Mr. New... Mr. John New? Yes. I'm Archibald Gopher, captain of the HMS Greyhound, out of Liverpool. Uh, welcome, Captain Gopher. You're here to pick up a shipment? Not exactly. You see, I'm here to take you home. Me? What are you talking about? Your father commissioned me to find you and bring you back to England, whatever the cost. I've been stopping at every trading post south of the Canaries searching for you. And finally, here you are. My father. Mr. Nutton! There she is, the Greyhound. After this, we've got two more ports of call to pick up ivory and beeswax. And then we shall set sail for Liverpool. And for you, home. Captain Gotha, a month ago I would have told you I had no hope or even dream of seeing England again. I was prepared to live out my days here, perhaps marry a native, even have my grave right here in West Africa. If I believed in God, I would say his hand had brought you here. Believe it. For else can it be? And so I began my journey home, not as a crewman, but as a passenger on the Greyhound. Freed of the duties I was used to, I had many hours at sea to think, to think about my life, to think about life itself. It was during these long hours of leisure that I discovered a book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akimpus. I began reading it, not as a meditational work, but as a work of fiction, an entertainment to pass the time. But as I read, the involuntary suggestion came to me. What if these words were true? What if the faith of this long dead writer was in fact a reality that I simply did not understand? I could not bear the inference as it related to myself. Dimly remembered scripture verses came unbidden to my mind, especially fearful passages that speak of the judgment of those who know the way of truth, but then depart from it. What if I were one of them? What if the faith I had abandoned was in fact the driving reality of the universe? What if God's hand had in fact been the moving force that brought me to this point? Brought Gotha to Sierra Leone to rescue me? What if I had turned my back on the very God who sought to save me? I was so caught up in my own thoughts and meditation that I had not even been aware of the storm that had engulfed us.
down. On the wheel. On the, the wheel. wheel. On the wheel. I thought back then on that powerful recurring dream that had haunted my life. I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. We had survived the most terrifying storm of my life at sea. But more than that, I had a glimmer of new hope, a spark of faith in my heart. In my darkest moment, I discovered a chance of reconciliation with a God that I had long dismissed as mere fiction. That was March 10th, 1748, a day that I would mark for the rest of my life as the day of my conversion. There is little doubt that our very cargo had saved us. The beeswax and the dyer's wood we carried being both lighter than water. The Greyhound was so swamped with water that we surely would have sunk if it were not for the flotation of the cargo itself. But was God's hand not present even in this detail? As we limped back toward England, crippled with only a few sails, I spent most of my time reading the scriptures, meditating, and praying to the Lord for mercy and instruction. I began to see my life in a different perspective. The burning anger that had driven me as a younger man was now faded. I began to see that my entire life was that of the parable of the prodigal son, not in a figurative way, as most people understand it, but in the most literal reality. Land ho! We sighted land on April 7th, the Irish island of Tory. The next day, we landed at Swilly. Finally, I was safely home after misadventures that seemed like a storybook. So, did you see your father? No. See, God's ways are very strange. You see, the day I arrived in Liverpool, I discovered that my father had shipped out only the day before for Canada. He'd been appointed governor of York's Fort in Hudson Bay Colony. I never saw him again. How sad. Did he know that you were saved? Oh, yes. Uh, we were able to write one another, so he knew the whole story. But he died there in Canada and was buried there, and I never saw him again. However, God gave me a new father, as it were, Joseph Manesty, who owned the ship that I had returned on, took me under his wing and treated me as if I were his own son. 
He got me a commission as first mate on a trade ship, and I did very well. Much of the rebellion in my spirit, the burning anger, had been washed away in Africa, and I no longer found myself always attracted to trouble. My new station in life secure, I could at long last go back to Kent and to my Polly, my beloved Polly. After years of remembering her face as in a dream, I was finally able to marry my dear Polly, the love of my life. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my troth. With this ring, I be wed. With my body, I be worship. And with all of my worldly goods, I be in now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Before long, my benefactor Joseph Manesty promoted me to captain, captain of my own ship, the Duke of Argyle. The Duke of Argyle was a slaving ship. So my job as captain was to take the ship to the west coast of Africa, very close to where I'd been held captive myself, pick up slaves there, transport them to the West Indies, there to exchange them for molasses and rum and return those to England. That's why we call it the triangular trade. Wait, you are a captain of a slave ship? After you were a slave yourself? How could you do that? You're a very astute young man. No, I was an infant in the faith and I really did not see the evils of the slave trade at the time. None of us did. It was considered an honorable way to make a living. But you were held captive. How could you do that to someone else? It was all too easy. You see, attitudes are starting to change now, but 20 years ago, no one questioned the slave trade, well, save the Quakers and a few Moravian missionaries in St. Thomas. Everyone in England that had any money at all had it invested in the slave trade. It was very profitable. And where profit is concerned, we turn a blind eye, don't we? All I could see at the time was that as a Christian ship captain, my job was to safely transport the slaves from one port to the other and treat them as well as possible, the same as I might do with a load of cattle. It wasn't uncommon on slave ships for almost a third of them to die on that middle passage. They were kept chained below decks, fed little food. I prided myself on the fact that only a few had ever died on my ships. I devised a routine of regular exercise for the slaves so that each day they would see the sunlight and keep themselves as fit and healthy as possible. I insisted with Mr. Manesty that we have sufficient provisions so that the slaves could maintain proper nourishment and not arrive starved. I did the same with the crew. I was proud that my ship had one of the best records for delivering slaves in good health. We only had a few deaths at sea. I felt each one personally and worked harder on each voyage to make sure that both crew and cargo stayed healthy and fit. It may not seem like much, but it was far more than most captains did in those days. I engaged the crew in regular times of worship. Ye shall have a song, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. Let us pray. It was on this journey that I had the chance to return to the Banana Islands, to my own place of enslavement. I was even able to find one of the lime trees that I had planted with my own hands so many years before.
Then came my third voyage in 1753 as captain of the African. We landed in Ghana to pick up a load of 600 slaves for transport to Jamaica. It was on that voyage that I began to first wonder about the slave trade. would be my last voyage. The weather looks good. We sail the day after tomorrow. I shall miss you terribly. I so wish you did not have to be gone so long. Yes, I know. But it is the nature of the trade. John? I'm afraid he suffered a stroke. I could no longer command a ship. How sad. It seemed very hard at the time, but we were later to understand that it was a blessing from God. A blessing? Yes, a blessing. You see, when God closes one way, it is often for a reason that we do not know or understand. Captain Potter, the man who took over the ship for me, and his entire crew were killed on that voyage. God, preserve us! Yes, he did preserve us. And it was a deep lesson, because what we thought was a curse at the time actually was filled with much grace. We moved back to Polly's family home in Kent for my recuperation. During this time, living in Kent, I had many hours of leisure, which I often spent outdoors. I had hours and hours for Bible study and for meditation. I spent many hours discovering the layers of grace present in our Lord's redeeming work. Slowly, I regained some of my strength, but I knew I would never again captain a ship. However, my knowledge of the business enabled me to obtain a position as Tide Surveyor of Liverpool, a position of great responsibility. Ahoy, Tide Pool Surveyor, state your cargo. 100 barrels of rum and 100 barrels of molasses from the islands. I worked for the customs office and was responsible to inspect incoming ships to make sure that proper import customs were paid to the government. Even with the remaining weakness from my stroke, I could still discharge the work with responsibility and yet have the free time to study the scriptures as I desired. Now that we were settled in a house in Liverpool, 
I made the most of my free time. I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. And I resolved to do nothing that would not serve that main purpose. I began to learn Greek, enough to allow me to understand the New Testament and the Septuagint. And then I began studying Hebrew the following year. I never attained a critical skill in any of these languages, but I had no goal but to truly and faithfully understand the scriptural words and phrases so that I could judge for myself the meaning of any particular passage. Together with this, I kept up a course of reading the best writers of Christian theology I could find. Out of this gradually arose a new desire. My mother's hope when I was a child was that I should enter the ministry. Now, for the first time, I began to feel a strong calling in that direction myself. It was not a calling of which I felt worthy, but I felt in some ways I was the perfect person to proclaim the faithful saying from 1 Timothy, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save the chief of sinners. My life had been full of such remarkable terms, I seemed selected to show what the Lord could do. My initial enthusiasm was damped by refusal after refusal to consider me for ordination. I did not give up easily, but in rapid order I was turned down by the established church, by the dissenters, by the Methodists, and by the Presbyterians. Though not yet ordained, I began to preach at churches around Liverpool and to be well received. The Lord bestows many blessings upon his people. But unless he likewise gives them a thankful heart, they lose much of the comfort they might have in them. And this is not only a blessing in itself, but an earnest of more. King David, when he was peacefully settled in his kingdom, purposed to express his gratitude by building a place for the ark. I began to receive more and more invitations to preach or to speak about my life experiences. Polly, Polly, read this. You're to be the pastor of the parish church of St. Peter and St. Paul and only? Oh, John, it is an answer to our prayers. I had to wait over seven long years, but finally my dream to serve as a parish pastor would become true. And that, Samuel, is how I came to be the pastor of this parish. Of course, that was a number of years ago before you were born. It is quite a story. Yes, and let it be a lesson to you. For the story that God has in mind for you may be very different from what you have planned. The great adventure is finding God's will for your life. Oh, I did not know you had company. <laughs> yes, this is Samuel we met in the village. Oh, aren't you Mrs. Watson's oldest? Aye, she's me stepmom. <laughs> Why don't you join us on Tuesday? John and I have begun a Bible school for the area children. Yes, you'll improve your reading skills and at the same time learn more about the Bible. If you're leading it, then I'll come. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Yes, John, please remember that William Cowper is coming later to work on the poem. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cowper and I are working on some spiritual poems which can be sung to popular tunes like uh, uh, Black Eyed Susan or Mad Robin. I know them! Of course you do. <laughs> you must be off now. Mr. Newton and Mr. Cowper have some very important work to do. Mr. Newton? Yes? Thanks for telling me your story. Well, thank you for listening, Samuel. And you'll be here on Tuesday. I'll be here on Tuesday. Very good, very good.
it is. John Newton? Yes, here. Read it. John Newton Clark, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long laboured to destroy. He changed my life. A few years later, he was called the St. Mary Waller Church in London. When I was old enough, I joined him there. And through him, I met William Wilberforce and joined the movement to abolish the slave trade. It took years. The bill passed Parliament in 1807, the same year that Mr. Newton died. And the same year that you were born, Alexandria. But he lived to see the abolition of the slave trade. Oh, so he did it? Well, not he alone, but many working together. He did change the world. And he changed one life. The life of a little boy who was hurt and angry at the world. He taught me something of gentleness and of God's grace. And I hope you have a chance to learn of that grace as well. <laughs>